Okay, so what uh, emerged uh, from yesterday's uh, and before the, the general history was that uh, the origin of the holiday of Hanukkah was not because of the miracle of the Pach Hashemen, it was because of the victory over the Yavanim, the ability to keep the Torah and the mitzvot, and the dedication of the Beis HaMikdash for eight days, and also the spiritual connection to Sukkot. Uh, as the Maral puts it, the Pach Hashemen miracle gives us the necessary perspective on the miracle of the Nitzachon of the Milchama. Meaning, uh, we win this victory against the Greeks, but we could attribute our success to our ability, our gaiva. So Hashem does this miracle of the oil in which we clearly see that the oil mitzad itself wouldn't have had the power to burn for eight days. And it was only because of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Therefore, we should see the Milchama in the same way. In other words, the Pach Hashemen is a giloi as to a revelation as to what is the proper perspective uh, as to the nature of the Nitzachan of the Milchama. It negates what would otherwise be called the attitude that the Torah describes as Kaychi v'yaitzim yadi, it's my strength and my ability that did all of this. And indeed, if you look at the Haftarah, for Shabbos Hanukkah, the Haftarah we read a few days ago, it is from the Navi Zechariah. Now remember, Zechariah is way before Hanukkah. Zechariah is at the very beginning of the building of the second Beis HaMikdash. This is more than 150 years before the Hanukkah story. But Zechariah has a vision of a menorah that is burning. And the words that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him as the menorah is giving off light, famous words, immortal words, Lo b'chayel v'lo b'koach, it is not by your valor, it is not by your strength, ki im beruchi, it is only through my spirit that you will be successful. So it's the obvious choice for the Hanukkah story, both in terms of the menorah in the vision and in terms of lo b'chayel v'lo b'koach, ki im beruchi. This is an issue that uh, Israel always grapples with. When Baruch Hashem, we have success, but there is always the risk of attributing the success uh, to our own efforts. Uh, and that could lead to arrogance, that could lead to gaiva, and then sometimes there'll be a corresponding cost to not remembering that Hashem is the, is the source. Yeah? It seems like from both sides, that the extremely secular side is that we, it's only through the army, and even some, I, I think it's an extreme position, but in the really religious side, that we don't, the army is bichla, like they should, we shouldn't be celebrating them. Do you have any, like, any way that we could be better at keeping this balance, that we do really need to do everything we can with the yeah. army, but it's only with Hashem's help? Yeah, no, no, that, that's a very, very important point. I uh, Meaning, uh, just as uh, for the army or for the military or for the government to say it's our greatness that was responsible for everything, just as that would be wrong. To simply denigrate the army is also wrong. To say, oh, all we need to do is learn, all we need to do is daven. The Torah clearly requires that we engage in what is called hishtadlus. We have to have an army. I mean, listen, it, when Moshe Rabbeinu was alive, <laughs> are we better than Moshe Rabbeinu? I mean, the Dor HaMidbar fought wars. Uh, so obviously, even when we were living a life of open miracles, a life of man, a life of be'er, a life where we had seen Kriyas Yamsuf and the Ten Makos, but we were mechayiv to wage war. This is how HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us a bracha, through our ishtadlis. So certainly we have to understand that a strong military is part of our ishtadlis, and that also means there's a duty of HaKara Satov, duty of gratitude. Uh, again, uh, Great Gedolim, like Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, had spoken about this all the way back in the Six-Day War. And that message needs to be heard and reheard, especially since, unfortunately, uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but there are some other voices within the From Yeshiva world that are Badafka saying that the army is nothing and the Chayolim are nothing and that we shouldn't pay any attention to them. That is a very, very pernicious attitude. It's, um, I don't want to say the word evil, maybe it's a strong word, but you know, it's not so far from even using uh, that particular Lashon. So yeah, we have to understand, we need both, we need both. But the Torah warns us not to have kochi v'yotzim yadi. I think I had mentioned, I don't want to get, again, too much political, 
But you know, one of the things that is, was most surprising about October 7 is the massive failure of Israeli intelligence. You know, Israeli military intelligence is really the best in the world, much, much better than US military intelligence. And the idea that they were just caught unawares, or, or maybe even worse, there were intelligence analysts who had said that Hamas was planning a big attack around Sukkot's time, and they were simply ignored by the higher-ups. The higher-ups said, nah, nothing, not, it's not going to happen. Hamas is not organized enough, and they're not smart enough, they don't have enough people. So Israel actually was in possession of this information. They didn't act upon it. This is a gigantic intelligence blunder, and when the attack finally happened, all the communications were cut. It took the army hours and hours and hours to respond to what they normally should have responded within like a half an hour or, or whatever, whatever it was. So it's almost miraculous in a negative way. The failures and the mistakes in those opening hours were virtually supernatural because they just shouldn't work that way. But part of what goes on is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sometimes shows us that we, when we think we're overconfident, when we think we're in charge, when we think we control everything, Hashem shows you that all of these systems can fail. Everything can fail. Things that you know, wouldn't have happened in a, in a third-rate, uh, third-world country or something happen to a very, very sophisticated military uh, intelligence system. And part of that reminds us that without HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there are just nothing that gives you any protection. So, but, you're, but you're correct. That, God forbid, should never replace the Akara Satov that we have to have for the Chayolim. Now, you understand that uh, what we said yesterday is a beautiful, beautiful answer to Rav Yosef Cairo's famous question. Right? Rav Yosef Cairo's famous question, this is called the Beit Yosef's question, he was not the first one who asked it, is if there was enough oil for one day and the miracle was it burnt for seven extra days, then the Hanukkah miracle is only seven days, not eight days. Why do we have a holiday for eight days? Famous question. I had mentioned there are 500 and some say 1,000 answers to it. But according to the Maral and according to the sources of the Book of Maccabees, it Bichlal is not a kasha because the eight days of Hanukkah is not because of the Neros. The eight days of Hanukkah is because of Hanukkah's Habes Habayas, as well as corresponding to Sukkot, which is seven days plus Shemini Yatzeres. So this would actually be a beautiful answer. But let me give you another answer. <laughs> One out of the thousand answers. You know, today is the fifth day of Hanukkah. Okay, so we've gone beyond the halfway point. But I don't know if you know this, but in Hasidus, the fifth day of Hanukkah is considered to be the most important day of Hanukkah. Uh, Chabad, but even, not, even outside of Chabad, they make special, special parties on the fifth day of Hanukkah. This is called Ner Chamishi. So what is so important about the fifth day of Hanukkah in Kabbalah and in Hasidus? So one point that's made is that the fifth day of Hanukkah is the only day of Hanukkah that can never fall out on a Shabbos. Every other day of Hanukkah could potentially be on a Shabbos. Again, th this is a consequence of the rule of Rosh Hashanah, meaning uh, there is a rule about Rosh Hashanah that Chazal say, and this is called Lo Adu Rosh. Adu is an abbreviation or an acronym. Aleph Dalit Vav, Adu. Meaning the first day of Rosh Hashanah cannot fall out on Sunday, cannot fall out on Wednesday, first day of Rosh Hashanah, cannot fall out on Friday. Lo adu rosh. Again, let me just digress just to go over why that's so. Now, this is a rule in the Jewish calendar that the first day of Rosh Hashanah cannot be Sunday, cannot be Wednesday, cannot be Friday. Okay, reason? Let's take Wednesday, Friday. That's a little easier. If the first day of Rosh Hashanah would be Wednesday, that means Yom Kippur would be Friday. If the first day of Rosh Hashanah would be Friday, that means Yom Kippur would be Sunday. So essentially, the rule about Rosh Hashanah not being Wednesday, Friday, is to prevent Yom Kippur 
from being Friday or Sunday. In other words, the Rosh Hashanah rule is because of Yom Kippur. Why don't we want Yom Kippur to be on Friday or Sunday? The reason is it dates back to the time that we know that you can't bury the dead on Shabbos or Yom Kippur. On Yom Tif, there are actually ways of doing it. On Yom Tif, there are ways of doing Kavura. But on Shabbos and uh, Yom Kippur, you wouldn't be able to bury the dead. And therefore, we never wanted two consecutive days where you couldn't do a funeral because before bodies could be preserved, there would be a putrefaction and decomposition and the like. So if I don't want Yom Kippur to be Friday or Sunday, Rosh Hashanah cannot be Wednesday or Friday. So that's the Dalid Vav. Now, why can't Rosh Hashanah be on Sunday? That's not the Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah is on Sunday. Yom Kippur is going to be Tuesday, right? Nothing wrong with that. So that's another reason. Because if Rosh Hashanah would be on Sunday, Hoshana Rabbah, the seventh day of Sukkot, would be on Shabbos. And we never want the seventh day of Sukkot to be on Shabbos because then we will be unable to beat the Arava, which is more important than Lulav and Esra. Because the first, day of, the first day of Sukkot can be on Shabbos. And then we don't take Lulav and Esra. But Chazal did not want to be Mavatel, the hitting of the willow. So the whole Jewish calendar was structured that Hoshana Rabbah cannot be on Shabbos. Therefore, Rosh Hashanah cannot be on Sunday because Hoshana Rabbah is day 21. Okay? So this is a famous rule. This is the most important rule of the Jewish calendar, actually. Lo adu rosh. Rosh Hashanah cannot be Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We're willing to, over, we're, right, we're willing to overrule blowing shofar. Yeah, it's a very good point. But again, uh, it, it, it's primarily a mystical idea that the, the shaking of the arava awakens powers of mercy of God as it brings rain. Uh, there's, there are certain powers in that ceremony that the Chachamim didn't want to abrogate, even though they were willing to abrogate shofar blowing when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, yeah? The original uh, calendar with witnesses naturally got over these problems, or did you have back in those times? Yeah, yeah, so that's a huge, that, that's actually a huge machlokas. That, that is a machlokas reshain, a very fascinating uh, uh, machlokas, and that is, uh, the rule of Loa du Rosh clearly applies when you have a set calendar. But remember that originally we didn't have a fixed calendar. It depended on witnesses showing up and testifying regarding the moon. So let's assume a witness shows up on a Wednesday or, 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 or Sunday or Friday. So that's the machlokas. Some Rishayim say that Bizman HaMikdash, when we actually uh, sanctified the new moon based on testimony, any day of the week could have been Rosh Hashanah, which, which, whatever the consequences are. Others say that these rules were even built into that system, that we wouldn't accept the witnesses then. Okay. Now, Again, this, is, this should be part of your general knowledge. Obviously, it's not our sugya. But the point you have to understand is, once you have a rule regarding what days Rosh Hashanah cannot fall out on, that's going to have an impact on what days every other holiday can fall out on. In other words, every other holiday cannot fall out on certain days because Rosh Hashanah couldn't be on certain days. So what that means in terms of Hanukkah, and again, uh, you could figure this out if you sit down with, a calendar, is that the fifth day of Hanukkah, which day of Kislev is that? Uh, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. The 29th of Kislev can never be on a Shabbos based on the Rosh Hashanah possibilities. So, okay, so that's an observation. The significance of the fifth day of Hanukkah today is it can never be on a Shabbos. Okay, so what? So here's what Hasidus says. Hasidus says, the fact that it can never be on Shabbos shows me that the spiritual light of the fifth day is so powerful. It never needs the augmentation of the light of Shabbos. Every other night of Hanukkah needs, so to speak, a connection with Shabbos to intensify its spiritual light. The fifth day has such a koach of or, spiritual or, that even without a connection to Shabbos, it's able to do its job. 
Now, that doesn't yet tell me why. In other words, that's just telling me the fifth night of Hanukkah, the or is stronger than any other night because you don't need Shabbos. But why would the or be stronger, the fifth night of Hanukkah? So here we come to a different idea or an additional idea. We have the Machlokes Beishamay and Beisilo, which we're going to talk about. Uh, how do you light the Hanukkah menorah? Do you go from eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one? Beishamay says you start with eight and you go down. Beisilo says you start with one and you go up. And of course, the halacha, as is as is ninety nine point nine percent of the time, Machlokes Beishamay and Beisilo, we follow Beisilo. Now, for the first four days of Hanukkah, Beis Shammai has more candles than Beis Hillel. Eight, seven, six, five. Beis Hillel is one, two, three, four. So Shammai wins the candle numbers for the first nights of Hanukkah. But starting with night number five, Beis Hillel beats Beis Shammai. Because starting with night number five, Beis Hillel is going to be five, six, seven, eight. Beis Shammai is going to be four, three, two, one. So, Ner Hamishi is the Hiskabrut, the overpowering by Beis Hillel of Beis Shammai. Okay, so why is that important? The answer is, because Beis and Beis Hillel have neshamos that are rooted in different aspects of the infinity of God. We know that Beis is usually machmer in halacha, although this is not a machlok, it's about chumr and kula here. Beis is usually machmer in halacha, and Beis is usually mekel in halacha. Now, people misunderstand this. Sometimes people think that they had a pre-existing agenda. That every time a Shiloh came to Beis Shammai, they would say, how can I be mean on people? How can I be strict? Let me find some way to make life hard. And Beis Hillel, ah, I want to make it easy. That's a distortion. There are many people in the world, in the Jewish world, that may have preconceived agendas in which they cherry-pick sources to come up with a result that they want to come up with. But that's a perversion. That's not how halacha works. That's not how a Talmud Chacham paskins. That's not how a Gadol paskins. And certainly, God forbid, that's not how the holy Tanoim of Beis and Beis Hillel would paskin. Rather, Beis and Beis Hillel were looking for truth. And whether that truth is lenient or whether that truth is strict, they are looking for truth. They are not looking for a preconceived result. That would be Sheker. So the question becomes, if they're both looking for truth, why is it that Beis Shammai typically finds truth in the stricter view and Beis Hillel finds truth in the more lenient view? If they're not looking for strict or lenient, they're not looking for it, they're looking for truth, then why does the truth always come out on the same side? So this is a very deep point. The point here is because the way you perceive truth is connected to the root of your neshama. Right? When, when you're learning Gemara, I mean, you know, people have arguments. And, you know, a svara means different things to different people. Sometimes, you know, you can say a svara that you're very convinced is a good svara. And the other person just doesn't feel, doesn't feel, that, feel it so powerfully, even if they don't reject it. And it's very difficult to, to analyze it exactly. Why do different svaras have different power to different people. It's not always a logical thing. It's not always, oh, I can point out this problem, this problem, this problem. Sometimes it's that. In other words, your svar is not good because this, this, that. Okay, that's, that's pure logic. But very often, it's not so much 
that there's something wrong with your svara. But it just doesn't grab me. I don't mean me in particular, but in other words, you can be it doesn't grab me, meaning it's not so powerful to me. Where does that come from? It's, it's, it's actually a mysterious process a little bit. Why are some people taken with a certain logic? And for some people, it leaves them kind of cold, even if they don't have a particular argument against it. In other words, arguments have qualitative weighing that are not always subject to specifics, specific refutations. And the answer is you're actually dealing with a Kabbalistic idea that the way we perceive truth is rooted in the source of our neshamos within God's infinity. If the shayrish of your neshama is in a certain place, you will perceive certain aspects of truth in a certain way. If the shayrish of your neshama is in a different aspect of God, you will perceive truth in a different way. Now we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is both chesed and din. Chesed and gevura. Beis shamais neshamos are said to be rooted in the midas hadin. Beis hillel's neshama is said to be rooted in the Midah of Rachamim. So be sure you, you get this. It's not that Beis Shammai is looking for Din and Beis Hillel is looking for Rachamim. No, that would be agenda picking. Beis Shammai is looking for truth and Beis Hillel is looking for truth. But based on the Shairish of their Neshama, Beis Shammai will see truth in the stricter positions, usually, usually. Beis Hillel will see truth in the more Rachamim positions. That's called the Shairish HaNeshama. Now, I'm not going to give all of us the benefit of that doubt. Sometimes, you know, we're not on that Madrega, so sometimes we see things just because of our biases, just because of our selfishness, just because we're going to, not everybody could claim well, this is coming from the shayrish of my neshama. Right, so I'm not going to say this applies to all of us all the time. Sometimes we're just being biased and we're just, you know, we want a certain result. But when you're dealing with gedolim, certainly, it's not that they have a preconceived result. Okay, but their shayrish and neshama causes a certain perception of emes. So now, let's go back to the Hanukkah candles. If it's understood, therefore, that Beis Shammai is rooted in Midas Adin, and Beis Hillel is rooted in Midas Arachamim. The day in which Beis Hillel is misgaber over Beis Shammai, that's the fifth day of Hanukkah, where Beis Hillel has five candles, and Beis Shammai has four candles, is a major transition point, because it spiritually represents the victory of Midas HaRachamim over Midas Adin. You see? Because Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel are typologies, meaning they represent certain spiritual kochos. And we celebrate when the Rachamim overpowers the Din. And that occurs from Ner Chamishi V'yelach. You know, who knows? I mean, we hope every day. Perhaps we will even see this year, perhaps, Bezras Hashem, maybe a turning point, a change, a Yisgabras of Rachamim that could lead uh, to freeing of the hostages. I understand that Israel is now engaged, a very, very dangerous mission right now, to try to rescue the hostages. Instead of having to do hostage trades, they're trying to do an Entebbe type of thing, which you know, is dangerous on all sides of everything. But you know, you know, who knows? Obviously, um, I guess it's not a totally military secret if I, if I happen to know about it, but I, mean, I, have, I have no particular connections, but, but obviously the details would have to be kept uh, secret, so do don't, don't tell anybody. Are. Huh? Do you think we know where they are? They, they say, they, 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 the, the news that I heard is they know where they are, yeah. In Gaza or in Egypt? Uh, well, I don't know where they know they are, but, but I, I think they, they, they feel that they know their location, yeah. Did we not 
<coughs> the way I understood that Rachamim, when we speak about Tevin Devorah, that Rachamim really is like, in, in Keser, there's no idea of din at all. Is this play, is there, is this saying that Beis Shammai is, is, is a, a different place or a lower place? Um, well, let me let me put it this way. In, in some in some ways, you can actually look at Beit Shammai as reflecting a higher spiritual level, because Beit Shammai is going back to Keser, where everything gets united. Um, in fact, the Arizal actually writes that Liasid Lava, whatever that means, Mashiach. The word Liasid Lava is a very slippery phrase, but at some point in the future, end of days. The halacha will not be like Beis Hillel, the halacha will be like Beis Shammai. Because Beis Shammai represents a higher spiritual level of perfection, but the world is not yet ready for it. As Beis Hillel kind of accommodates to a weaker world, Beis Shammai is a higher level, and uh, in the, the end of days, whatever exact period that means, the halacha is going to be like Beis Shammai. Uh, the, that's a teaching of the Arizal. The Gemara doesn't, there's nothing in the Gemara that says that, but, but the Arizal says the halacha will be like Beis Shammai Liyosid, Liyosid Levin. Yeah. And, and when we're dealing with people today, is this like uh, advice? Can, can we take what you say as advice as to how we try to speak to people as well? That it's, maybe that we might say something that's being enti well, entirely logical, as logical as possible, but we have to make perhaps different arguments to different people because it just doesn't, it doesn't there's just something that's not, uh, that's part of agreeing and disagreeing, that's not logic, that's, that's what we say. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think I think you know that that's certainly um, a very very sensible proposition. That uh, you know, logic uh, is not the only thing that moves people. I think all of us know that. And uh, you know, there's an old saying in the Kirov world that uh, the Rebetzin's Cholent makes more people from than the Rabbi's Drasha. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very true, and not because the Cholent has to be so good, but the concept is that ultimately. People make commitments to Yiddishkeit based on the warmth and the friendship and the care that they see from rabbis, rebbitzins, friends. And that warmth and the care that they sense, uh, you want to become part of that community. I want to be part of a community of people that care and want to grow and take care of each other. And then you, you work on the intellectual foundations. I mean, Baruch Hashem, Judaism is not just a cult of emotionalism. I mean, certainly we have uh, an intellectual tradition. I mean, our, I mean, our whole life is bound with Talmud Torah, and we have a strong philosophical structure. That's for sure. But I'm suggesting that what makes people gravitate to the system is not the philosophy. The philosophy is the thing that will keep you in because, you know, you want to know that what you're doing makes sense, so we need to show you that it makes sense. But I, I don't, again, maybe I'm overgeneralizing. I mean, everyone has their own journey. But I think in many, many cases, at least, it is not what made me from. Maybe it's what keeps me from or, or whatever it is. What made me from is the sense of connection, the sense of warmth, the sense of belonging, which is a very, very, very powerful, powerful uh, way that people connect. Because, you know, um, we live in a very lonely world. And in fact, um, what can I tell I don't want to get political here, but... Um, this anti-Semitism that's going on in the United States, the college campuses, the college presidents. Uh, by the way, people say, oh, Baruch Hashem, the uh, woman, the president of the University of Pennsylvania uh, was forced to resign because she didn't take a strong enough stand against anti-Semitism. So Baruch Hashem, University of Pennsylvania is standing up against anti-Semitism. Well, no. Uh, what made her resign was a guy had promised $100 million, which he was going to withdraw. Uh, unless she resigned. So it's not that the board of, uh, whatever, the board of directors, uh, board of trustees of Penn, all of a sudden became lovers of Jews. Uh, they were lovers of $100 million <laughs> that they didn't want to lose. So that, okay, so, but, but I think what, what we're discovering, I mean, someone told me, someone who works in college, Kirov, told me, you know, they had Shabbatones, they make a Shabbaton every week, uh, whatever this campus is. And a student walked in, like just last week or two weeks ago, who never showed up to any Jewish event at all. Totally not interested, totally not connected. He's not connected to anything Jewish. But he just walked in the Friday night uh, dinner and he said, I see I have to be with you guys. I see that you are my friends, you are my family, you are my community. Because all the people that I thought were my community 
and my friends. Nobody stands up for me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody cares if, if they hear people saying we ought to wipe, wipe Jews off the face of the earth. So what's going on here? This is not an intellectual process. This is the notion of human beings go where they feel welcomed, where they feel connected. Where they, so I think the warmth is a major, major, major issue. And although, of course, uh, we need the intellectual understanding of what Judaism is, but as I say, I think that keeps you in, but that does not cement the commitment itself. Uh, the commitment itself comes from, as they say, the Rebetzin's Cholent, however that is, uh, however you define that, you know. Uh, so you have to know how to talk to people. I mean, this idea that um, I'm going to make you firm because I'm going to convince you in, in, in 45 minutes that God gave the Torah to Moshe at Sinai, I, I don't think, I don't think, maybe it's a chisarin that we're not so intellectually honest, but I don't think that, you know, I'm going to hear that argument and therefore I've got to change my life. How can I not change? I mean, sometimes people talk that way, but I, I don't know. It's, it's, it sounds a little unrealistic. But again, I, I don't mean to overgeneralize because every... Every person has their own mahalach, so, uh, you know, I don't... Maybe some people do have those kind of changeovers. But in my experience, that's not typically how, how it works. Okay. Um, all righty. So that's the significance of the fifth day of Hanukkah, right? So now you know why Nir Hamishi is a big deal. It's the hiskabrus, the overpowering of the Midas HaChesed over the Midas Adin. And therefore, the light of the Neros is now the light of Rachamim, rather than the light of light of the. Did you want to say something? I had a question. Yeah. Um, coming back to qualities of arguments. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier the strong philosophical uh, tradition in Yiddishkeit, and in uh, contemporary non-Yiddishkeit philosophy, there is also the quality of arguments being validity and soundness. I'm curious if these two qualities, validity and soundness, are compatible with our understanding of Shorosh Nefesh, because they're very similar, where it's like mathematically an argument can make perfect sense and it would be valid. Yep. But if there's something wrong with the truth values, yes. the truths of parts of the argument, then it doesn't actually... No, that's, that's exactly correct. And that, that's where I think analytical philosophy cannot really do a great job exploring that reality which is undoubtedly true and that is the valence, the weight of an argument. Um, because there is a lot of subjectivity in, in, in assessments of, of weight and it's very difficult to analytically put your finger on it. So we would call it Shorish Hanashama. I'm not sure what they would call it. Uh, but they, I mean obviously it's a problem that any philosopher, philosophy has to deal with but I'm not sure if they even have the vocabulary that can really describe that. I mean, it's just a reality of life. Some arguments leave you cold. They just don't, you know, push you over the cliff or whatever it would be. And you can't even give a reason why that is, that is so. So there's a certain role for intuition at best. You may call it intuition. We would call it shorish, you know, shorish haneshama. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Now, let me just mention another uh, answer to the Beis Yosef's Kasha based on this similar cheshven. You know, question once again, why is Hanukkah eight days? It ought to be seven days. So think about it this way. This is another Beis Shammai Beis Shammai connection. If Hanukkah would be seven days, on the fourth day of Hanukkah, Shammai and Hillel would have the same number of candles. <laughs> right? Because what would you have? Uh, Hillel would be one, two, three, four. Shammai would be seven, six, five, four. And halachically, it's very important that you demonstrate that you're following Beis Hillel rather than Beis Shammai. So Hanukkah has to be eight because that way there will never be a day where Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel would have the same number of candles. Do you remember the Mishnah in Brachos? The Mishnah in Brachos says, a machlokas Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, how you're supposed to recite Shema because the Torah describes Shema as b'shach b'cha, when you lie down, it, and at night, uva kumecha, when you get up in the morning. Beis Shammai says it's very literal. The Arvis Shema must be recited when you are lying down. And the morning Shema must be recited when you're standing up. That's Beis Shammai. 
Beis Hillel says, no, that's not what it means. Veshach Becha doesn't mean when you're lying down. It means the time when people begin to go to sleep at night, in other words, is when you say Shema. And Vekumecha doesn't mean when you're standing up, but it means the time when people get up, you know, the first part of the day. Now, Rabbi Tarfa recounted that I was once traveling at night, and I thought I'd like to be strict like Beit Shammai. So I made a point of lying down to recite the evening Shema, and I almost lost my life by highway robbers. <laughs> you know? And so he thought he was asking for compassion, and the Chacham said to him, tough love, hey, you deserve to die because you're following Beit Shammai over Beit Shilo. Right? So he wasn't getting sympathy from that, from that quarter. But you see, in other words, that the Chachamim had a point that it's important to show that you're following Beis Hillel. If Hanukkah would be seven days, on the fourth day it wouldn't be clear if you're following Beis Shammai or Beis Hillel. In fact, they even say this is a remes in the very name Chanukah. This is a drush for sure, which could be read as an acronym. Ches Neiros. Eight candles, meaning we light eight candles, eight days, in other words, why? Vahalacha, the vav, vahalacha, kaf, kebeis, hillel. We have eight days, so the halacha will be clearly like beis hillel every night of Hanukkah. It's a, it's a chasidish yeah. So it doesn't get locked in just like it's a, a halacha remez. Could you maybe say something like if there's a need that the progression of chesed and the diminishment of din are not seen as synonymous processes at the same time? Like, would it be able to work it out some way that you can get at something underlying it? So it's not just a matter of, well, we want to make sure that we're not mixing up who goes like who? In other words, you don't, you don't want... Well, it's interesting. In other words, uh, at any given time, there needs to be a seesaw effect in which sometimes chesed is more... In other words, it should never be in total right, that equilibrium. The processes of chesed should not be... Like the progression of chesed or the, the, or the, or the diminishment of din, that you shouldn't see that as the same process. Okay. All right. Okay. That would be more of a, more of a Kabbalistic way of, of making that point. Okay. Okay. I hear you. Okay. So now, I still want to go more into this Machlokas Beishamay and Beisolo. The Gemara gives two reasons. This is a Gemara in Masechah Shabbos. The Gemara gives two reasons for the Machlokas Beishamay and Beisolo. The first reason seems not to be a reason at all. It just states their conclusions. It says, Beis Shammai says, light your candles based on the days that are coming towards you. So on day one, including that day, I have eight days of Hanukkah coming towards me. Day two, including that day, I have seven days. In other words, Beis Shammai is looking at the days that are coming towards me. Beis Hillel is looking at the days that have passed me by. Again, including that day. So day one, the first day is passing me by. Day two, two days have passed me by, etc. Right, so Beis Shammai is looking at the days that are coming future, Beis Hillel is looking at the days that have passed you. Inclu Both of them are including you know, the day that you're in. But L'chaira, that's, that's not really a reason, that's just describing that Beis Shammai says eight and you go down, Beis Hillel says you go up. So what's the idea here? So there's a beautiful essay by the great Rav Shlomo Yosef Zevin Rav Zevin, Zechorin Olav Racha. Rav Zevin uh, was a gadol who died in the 1970s. Uh, he was not a Rosh Hashiva. He was the founding editor of the Encyclopedia Talmudis. It was one of the things that he did. That's the big yellow Talmud Encyclopedia. Um, he was a very rare type of gadol. Number one, he had a phenomenal knowledge of Kala Tarakula. For many, many years, he would write book reviews of Svarim that came out. Book reviews of Svarim. And the most complicated Sefer, he would like read the way people would read a novel. 
and uh, someone p came out with Shalos to Shuba, so he would write a book review of the Shalos Nevis and point out, oh, in Shuba, Kuflam and Zion, he forgot to mention the Nehdeb Yehuda, or he forgot to mention the Pnei Yoshua, whatever, like, he had like comments on everything. And he was also very, very rare because he was a person, one of the very few people who ever lived, who was connected with every single camp within Torah Judaism. He was close to Rav Kook. He was close to the Brisker Rav, who were very opposite, the Chazonish. He was a Lubavitcher Chassid who was a member of Mizrahi, religious Zionism. So he was Chabad, religious Zionism, Chazonish, Brisker Rav, and Rav Kook. I mean, just there was no one like that today who could possibly coexist in all of these many, many, many worlds. In fact, he even had a good connection with Rabbi Shaul Lieberman, who's a controversial person in the Jewish Theological Seminary, whatever it is. He was connected to him, too. He was connected to everybody. And uh, Rav Zevin wrote a whole essay explaining Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel. And I'll start this. I'm not going to finish this now. I'll continue it tomorrow. But let me, let me just explain what his issue is. We normally think that every machlokas is based on Beis Shammai is strict and Beis Hillel is lenient. And yeah, many machloksim follow that pattern. But some machloksim don't follow that pattern. For example, let's take the Hanukkah machlokas. Starting with eight and going down or starting with one and going up, that's not a question of Chumrah or Kula. They're both using the same number of candles. So how do you explain conceptually, is it just like another machlokas? How do you fit in a machlokas like Hanukkah candles to the Chumrah and Kula idea of Shammai and Hillel? Or let me give you another example. In the eighth parak of Maseches Brachos, there's a machlokas be Shammai and Beis Hillel how do you make Kiddush Friday night? Beis Shammai says, first you make the bracha over Shabbos, Mekadesh Shabbos. Then you say, Bere Priyagafen, and then you drink. That's what Beis Shammai says. Beis Hillel says, like we do, you first make the Bere Priyagafen, then you make the Mekadesh Shabbos. Now there too, that has nothing to do with Chumrah or Kula. They're both saying the same two things, the bracha on Yayin and the bracha on Shabbos, and they are just disagreeing about the order. So Rav Zevin wanted to develop a thesis that instead of just looking at this as a separate thing, this all fits under the notion of Chumrah and Kula if you understand this at a deeper level. And the basic idea is, Beis Shammai looks at the world as it should be, an idealist, and Beis Hillel looks at the world as it is imperfectly realized. And here is the Yisot. Rashi himself brings from the Medrash that it was Hashem's original plan to create the world based on Midas Hadin. How do we know this? Because what does the Chumash say? Bereishis bara Elohim. In the beginning, the world was created by Elohim. Elohim is the name of Hashem. That is the Midas Hadin. God's original plan was a world based on din. That means you do an Avera, you're gone. You do a mitzvah, you get a million dollars. But Hashem then saw that the world could not survive on Midas Sadin. So he combined Rachamim with din. And that's why it later says, instead of Bereshis Bara Lokim, it says, Biyom Asos, Hashem, Hashem is Yitke Vavke Elokim, Eretz Vishamayim, Rachamim Indin. Now, putting aside for now, maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow a little bit, the philosophical problem of 
mean God wanted to do it this way and then saw it didn't work? Like what's going on with God changing his mind or regretting a decision? Putting that question aside, that is a good question, but putting that question aside, you see that God's ideal world would have been din. The combination of din and rachamim is God's concession to the weaknesses of human beings who are given free will. So in a sense, when Beishamai follows the Midas Sadin, he is following it based on God's original plan. When Beis Hillel is following Midas HaRachamim, he is following it based on the imperfect realization of that plan due to human frailty. In fact, that actually explains the Arizal that I mentioned earlier, that the Yasid Lava, we will go like Beis Shammai because the world itself will be based on Din because you no, no, you no longer need the concession to human weakness. So in a sense, Beis Shammai issues halachic rulings based on the way the world should be. Beis Hillel issues halachic rulings based on the way the world actually is. So to use modern English words, we will call Beis Shammai an idealist, Beis Hillel a pragmatist. But again, again, I have to be very careful with those words. I don't mean pragmatist in the sense of a self-conscious agenda. It goes back to Shorosh HaNeshama. But Beis Shammai is rooted in Hashem's original machshava. Beis Hillel is rooted in Hashem's final maisa. And this explains the kula and the chumrah. And tomorrow I'll go over how does it explain the other machloksim. We'll actually explain the other machloksim as well. So it's not even a question of leniency or strict. It's a question of rooted in the original intention versus the realization. And, and Rav Zevin will show brilliantly how this explains the other machloksim. So I'll, I'll leave it for tomorrow and we'll go weiter and we'll see how this connects to the Hanukkah story. Thank you for listening to this awesome Eich production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.